Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Tequila Talks, your friend Tequila Bay. Tonight we're gonna be switching gears. I know on our last video we talked about um, jumping back into cocktail series, but this evening we're going back to Tequila Talks and we're gonna be drinking Tequila Ocho. We have the Blanco and the Reposado here in front of us. And Tequila Ocho for those agave lovers, for those additive free lover tequila, uh, tequila drinkers, you already know this product. And if you're new, if you've never heard of Tequila Ocho, Stay tuned because we're going to be drinking a great product. So let's go right ahead and jump right into it. So Tequila Ocho was founded by Carlos Camarena and Tomas Estes. And really their mission with this tequila was to prove how important terroir is in the conversation of tequila distilling, tequila harvesting, tequila making just as a whole. So in our previous video with Don Fulano, we talked about how Don Fulano is in influencing the market and in influencing the industry with their marriage of the wine world, the tequila world, the influence of terroir, but really Tequila Ocho, Carlos Camarena, and Tomas Estes, they were the pioneers. They were the, uh, the, the, the grandfathers, the, the forefathers, the founding fathers of this concept of terroir. So in front of us, we have to my right, we have the single estate La Cañada Blanco, and to my left, we have the San Jerónimo single estate reposado. So if you're not familiar with the conversation of terroir and what that might necessarily mean, all terroir really means is how important the, uh, the weather, the region, the soil, all of those natural and geographic factors that can influence a raw material and how that geographic factor plays a role into a uh, product that's being created like tequila or like certain French wines or like certain bourbons or certain things that have these appellations of origin and how important the terroir, the water, the soil, the temperature, humidity, all these factors that can create different components in a raw material in an agave. So without uh, further ado, I think I might wanna go ahead and start to crack this bottle open so that we can dive right into what uh, uniqueness this terroir is bringing into this conversation. So again, if you look at these bottles, and I think what a lot of distilleries and tequila makers are gonna start doing is on these single estate or these terroir driven products, you're gonna find all the information that's important for you to define batch numbers, lot numbers, um, terroir influence. So right on the bottle, you're able to see that La Cañada, or the region, the, the estate where they harvested these agaves, was at 2,115 meters of elevation in Arandas, Jalisco. You have the bottle number here, and you also have, you should have the lot number, I'm not really seeing it right on the front, but this lot number and this bottle number is important so that people like myself, or again, those really diehard aficionados of tequila, those additive-free aficionados, can really pinpoint that that variance in this tequila product. So we're able to start pinpointing variants, whether it was a rainier season, a drier season, what estate these agaves are coming from, and we can pick our favorite tequila based on this terroir-driven um, variant. So uh, coming out of 1474, Los Alambiques Distillery, this is the house of Tequila Ocho. Additive free, again, I will reiterate that because it's a very important topic of conversation. So. Let's go ahead and pour this up. So Tequila Ocho, the Blanco was recognized by, let's go ahead and add a little bit more. It was recognized by Forbes Magazine. Ooh, I'm spilling. <laughs> uh, recognized by Forbes Magazine as the world's best Blanco tequila. So let's go ahead and drink it here with you guys and see what we can develop, what we can notice. Let's let it breathe a little bit. So. A little bit of the background of the brand. So Tequila Ocho, you might wonder like, what is the Ocho? Where is the name influence coming from? So uh, the Tequila Ocho was the eighth batch that was given to Tomas Estes to try. And that batch was like what made it definitive, what made it understood that yes, we're gonna, pr uh, we're gonna start producing this tequila and we're gonna move forward this project. So Carlos Camarena has eight siblings. The Reposado here to my left uh, sits in a barrel for eight months and eight days. The agaves that they're maturing on average are taking anywhere uh, between uh, six to nine years of maturation, but eight is that sweet spot. So this whole concept of eight, tequila ocho, 
Uh, what else are they doing? What, what else did I see about the eight? I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but like all of this influence of eight, the eighth batch, the eight siblings, the eight months of resting, uh, it's really old, a really cool fact. So the uh, amount of time, so it takes eight days from the agave to arrive at Los Alambiques, eight days from Alambiques agave into Alambiques tequila. So this, this influence of eight, tequila ocho, so let's go ahead and dive right in. For those of you that know what you want to look for in a blanco and an additive free tequila, you start to notice right off the uh, right off the rip those cooked agave notes, agave right at the front, the grassy herbaceous component, slight flashes of bright citrus. Again, we're not creating an extremely complex spirit. You want to just notice at the core of the agave and all those beautiful notes that enhance those flavors. Grassy notes, herbal notes, agave notes, and citrus. So, salud. I haven't drank tequila all day, which I think that might be a good thing because I don't want to be drinking it all day. So a little bit astringent. So I got to let my palate adjust, but right off the rip, that agave, I notice a lot much more pepperiness and earth forward notes, a little bit more maturity in the flavor profile than on the nose. But again, for for those connoisseurs, for those people that understand those flavor components, that, that pepper on the, on the palate, that citrus, that herbal, the grass, the agave. Mm. Mm -hmm. Extremely smooth. I only mentioned astringency in the sense of like the feel on the tongue. It burned a little bit. But now as my tongue adjusts, extremely smooth. The finish is cool. It's long lasting. Agave is at the core. So again, for people that want to drink these tried and true expressions, no additives, no bull jive, nothing of that nature. You want to draw the raw product, the raw influence of how these tequilas are made and should be made. Tequila Ocho is the way to go. So I want to give a little bit of room again to be able to talk about that terroir influence. So if uh, and so I'm going to save myself and I'm going to drink a little bit of that reposado. This one comes from San Jerónimo, which again is one of the estates that are uh, they're growing agaves from bottle number 139,394. This one sits at altitude of 1200 meters. So when we think about the, the terroir, there's a conversation of Los Altos or Los Valles. The Altos are the highlands, Los Valles are the valleys or the lowlands. But when you think about Los Valles, uh, you're also still sitting at about two, two to 3,000 meters in elevation in Los Valles. So we're still in some pretty high altitude, but Los Altos are reaching those five, 6,000 meters in elevation. So when we think about that terroir, Los Valles are lower lands in the Arandas or the Jalisco region you have Tierra Negra, which is dark soil, volcanic soil that nurtures the agave in a different fashion versus Los Altos that has a much more iron forward, red iron soil that's very rich in mineral and it creates different nuances between those agaves. The agaves in the lowlands are tend to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more rough, a little bit more masculine, a little bit more, um, mineral forward versus the agaves that sit at higher altitudes that tend to be a little bit softer, fruitier, grassier agave forward. So let's go ahead and see if this follows suit with that terroir influence, so that elevation change. Rest it again for eight months and eight days. It's gotta be some proprietary intention there. But what I like in a tequila, and again, for those tried and true drinkers of tequila, you don't want a lot of abocante or additive or even oaking. To a degree, the oaking, the barreling is an abocante. A natural way 
to add that avocante and that layer of flavor, but that's why I always choose to drink those blancos to really get an expression of what that agave plant is doing, what the distillery and what the maestro tequilero is doing with that tequila. But again, what I love about the, uh, the tequila ocho reposado, it's almost clear, very straw-like golden color. And that's actually a process of their intention when they're barreling. So they're barreling and used American whiskey barrels, but then they're doing so many turns of tequila that eventually that oaking is completely stripped and it's only adding a slight nuance of oaking influence. So. Slight oak, hints of vanilla. I notice a little bit more of those pepper notes, of those mineral notes, flashes of citrus. Agave is still at that core. We're not stripping anything. We're not adding too much oak. Salucita. Mm. Much more complexity in this one. And I think a little bit, you know, the barrel influence, that tannic property, very silky, velvety. Mm. A little bit smoky on the finish. Mm. Hints of like, maybe licorice, kind of medicinal to a degree, but much more complex, slight barreling, but again, maybe that influence again of that elevation of the agave that's going in a much more mineral rich area, lower elevation. So what? Carlos Camarena and rest in peace Tomas Estes were able to figure out and prove um, to their understanding is that terroir is an influence in tequila. So. This is why it's important to focus on tequila that's being made additive free. I'm a firm believer that all tequila has its value add. I tend to not talk extremely negative about additive tequilas because again, they do bring value adds. Not my choice for those that are watching that might leave a comment. Not my choice in tequila. I choose these productions. I choose these standards, but when you think about that influence of the avocante, the additive, you do not want to be tarnishing this product because of the terroir influence, about the factors of these agaves that are being used to produce tequila. This divinity in terroir is gonna take tequila to the next level, and it's gonna grow tequila to become an even more world-class and renowned product. So please, take note, sip some tequila ocho, and this has my stamp of approval. As I drink more, it gets more smooth, smoother and smoother as it goes. But um, I have to be very careful because I do not want to overdo it. We got a couple other videos coming up. So please, if you like this video, go ahead and leave your comments. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on Instagram, on TikTok, Tequila Bay Official. We are fully committed to delivering great tequila content, to delivering great reviews. If you have any additional comments or any experiences that you might have had with Tequila Ocho, please go ahead and leave that in the comments. On our next episode of Tequila Talks, we're gonna be talking about Tequila Don Julio. Don Julio is a very well-known brand, extremely, extremely reputable, and it has one of the most iconic tequilas, Don Julio 1942. Maybe not loved again by those aficionados, but the Tequila 1942, Don Julio 1942 brought so much value add to the world of tequila. We're gonna be discussing Tequila Don Julio on our next episode. So thank you very much for tuning in tonight. We'll see you on the next Tequila Talks. Salucita. And shoot your shot and sip tequila. Baby.